want to, you know, to to thank Ayman and, and Peter. It's 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 a, it's a treat and an honor to you know to share the stage with them and also the students from from SJP. You know, thank you very much for having me and I apologize to everybody for turning up late. Um, one of, one of my uh, charges as as uh, a, a teacher is is to uh, to uh, share you know, uh, non-stereotypical aspects of Arab culture. And so I, I, I just performed uh, an element of well, kind of a stereotypical Arab culture that happens to be true. Uh, we, we, we're not very good at being on time, but I, 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 I apologize. Um, <clears throat> well, but, I mean, before I say anything about, um, about Palestine or the University of Illinois, uh, let me first acknowledge that what happened to me has been happening to ethnic, sexual, and cultural minorities in academe for decades. African Americans especially, and it continues to happen today. A shameful irony is that Jews were long marginalized in the academy because of their supposed dangers to Anglo civility. Victim to rationalizations for their exclusion that sadly don't look terribly different than the ones now being used against supporters of Palestinian human rights. The suppression of blackness and indigeneity predates the purge of Palestine and in many ways contextualizes and sustains it. The regulation of deviant bodies, idea, uh, ideas, and identities has influenced American campuses since their inception. In my situation, I don't think we should overlook the sheer arrogance with which the Board of Trustees has conducted itself. When James Montgomery, the only trustee to, to vote in favor of my appointment, finished an extraordinarily moving speech about his experiences of racism, board members responded with ill-advised and unfunny jokes. The board members have provided numerous instances of boorishness. Um, <clears throat> Ali Abunima caught system president Robert Easter in a flat out lie. The board and the chancellor can't seem to get their story straight. Watching my own firing happen publicly on the internet was surreal, but not just for me. Anybody who tuned in could see how the corporatization of academe functions in real time. <clears throat> I think more than anything, the egregiousness of UIUC's decision illustrates that the furtive codes of campus repression have become less necessary. Academe has never been free. Universities don't like to be openly repressive, however. There are countless mechanisms in place to ensure conformity to the imperatives of the powerful and wealthy. These mechanisms regulate tone, content, action, and access. They will become unnecessary only when campuses become openly dictatorial. UIUC took a significant and unapologetic step in that direction. If boards and other upper administrators can simply decide without faculty consultation or the inconvenience of shared governance who is fit to teach and research, then the paradigms of higher education change in ways that contravene the very purpose of the university. I have no nostalgia about our academic past or of the utility of free speech in American society as a whole. Rights have never been comprehensive, but with this new paradigm, academic freedom won't even exist in theory. Please bear in mind that board members have zero qualifications to evaluate my teaching or scholarship. They've never taught college. They know nothing about indigenous peoples, American Indians, the Israel-Palestine conflict, Arab Americans, Palestine, the Middle East, Pacific Islanders, military occupation, native nationalism, literary criticism, hermeneutics, critical theory, decolonization, scholarship, journal publishing, peer review, university presses, departmental service, advising, grading, curriculum, or how to compose a solitary footnote. Um, how exactly this makes them qualified to make hiring decisions on behalf of the American Indian Studies program is a mystery. Questions arise about funding. 
But they have an easy answer. It's always in some way about funding, isn't it? If you crunch the raw numbers, though, it's clear that the university doesn't receive a windfall from its, its pro-Israel donors. Steve Miller's largest gift appears to have been half a million. Other donors cited figures of, of a few hundred thousand. This is chunk change to any huge research university. The value of Zionist donors isn't merely about bank balances. It's about respectability and the unquantifiable value that accompanies it. Siding with Israel isn't necessarily about making money. It's also about political ambition, conformity, establishment bona fides, state power. In other words, about maintaining the status quo. It's about keeping power consolidated among the elite. It's about not setting the terrible precedent of allowing the colonized a say in their own futures. Political capital coheres and can never be precisely measured by supporting the preferred position of the elite. There's rarely risk in siding with the powerful, but never is there dignity in such a choice. Academics themselves are often complicit in restrictions on our freedom, so I don't think it's helpful to create a firm distinction between faculty and administration. The distinction should be made around faculty interests and administrative interests. One needn't be an administrator to supplement administrative interests. For this reason, I hope we complicate academic freedom, even as we vigorously defend it. For example, contingent faculty have no functional academic freedom, or adjunct as they're sometimes called. They can be fired for unpopular speech without much recourse. It's not just finances that compel administrators to rely more heavily on untendered labor. It ensures a power balance that strongly favors the administration. The government has long relied on the private workplace to stifle speech rights. Whereas one, hypothetically, cannot be imprisoned for speech, one can be fired by private employers for it, a mechanism of plutocratic control. It's a further entanglement of state and corporation, and a further entanglement of corporation and university. <clears throat> Scholarship, for instance, is never supposed to be political. What does political mean? Basically fighting injustice, taking a stand, expressing an opinion, right? laying out a set of ethics. <clears throat> Scholarship and scholars are supposed to be above such trifling pursuits. We demystify the things we study, but we don't participate in them. We explicate, but we do not manipulate. We're like the film crew of a nature show. We document and explain, but never intervene when one animal devours another. To be called political is immediately to become suspect among one's colleagues, to be marked as radical, another term with its own history of coerciveness. Serious scholars can never be radical. Let's look at the term most relevant to our current situation, civility which is a reboot of the long-standing canard of collegiality. I believe that civility, although it performs the same course of function as collegiality, is, is far more insidious and threatening.
civility, which is a reboot of the long-standing canard of collegiality. I've mentioned informal modes of repression. They're not informal in the sense of being random, but of being unauthorized or extra-legal. All industrial democracies rely to some degree on informal repression, what Chomsky called manufacturing consent, and Gramsci before him termed hegemony. It is endemic to universities in particular because the conceits of shared governance and academic freedom must be delimited without open suppression, even though open suppression happens plenty. <clears throat> Hence, collegiality is a measure of performance. It's a sprawling and subjective word, <clears throat> which is precisely its utility. I'm not going to attempt the definition because I consider it a pointless enterprise. I want to examine instead how its ambiguity facilitates conformity to majoritarian sensibilities. Valuable ideas disrupt, reorder, undermine, confront, subvert, unsettle, upset, menace, admonish, forebode. Critical thinking is fundamentally incompatible with conformity, which is collegiality's primary desire. Collegiality largely performs two functions. It can be used as a pretext to punish somebody whose work is stellar, but who doesn't fit in with colleagues. Here are the severe problems of race, class, gender, sexuality, and culture should be obvious. And it can name unconventional scholarship as inferior because it doesn't recycle established ideas and methodologies. Collegiality is the etiquette of submission. It's impossible to be collegial when challenging the common sense of corporate dominion, no matter how politely you state the criticism. Now, collegiality has given way to civility, which creates a new set of challenges to academic freedom. The usefulness of the term as a silencing mechanism is, a, is apparent by how many upper administrators have embraced it. Its basic function is identical to that of collegiality, but it more explicitly evokes colonial violence. The very act of using uncivil to describe supporters of Palestine or any other site of decolonization is a terrible irony. The accusation locates the subject in the wretchedness of subhumanity, but implicates the speaker in centuries of colonization and genocide. Remember, I was hired in the American Indian Studies program. I still shake my head that the powers that be decided to rationalize their abrogation of academic freedom and faculty governance by invoking the terminology of New World colonization. It actually puts me in mind of George W. Bush calling his war on the Iraq a crusade. It's, it's another reminder that there's no appreciable correlation between intelligence and authority. <laughs>